Thank you for participating in the ninth annual Black Star Film Festival. We would like to thank our funders and individual donors, as well as our network of producing and community partners. This panel is supported in part by Firelight Media and Leeway Foundation. The runtime for this panel is 60 minutes, including audience Q&A. So please leave your questions in the comments and we'll do our best to engage them. Please follow us on all social media platforms at Black Star Fest and use the hashtags BSFF20 and Black Star 20 So Lit. We hope you have a wonderful time during the 2020 Black Star Film Festival. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this panel, Mothering and Laboring the Cinematic Revolution. I'm Farah, the panel producer, and I'm delighted to briefly introduce the truly amazing people participating in our conversation. Our moderator, Danny McLean, is someone we've admired at Black Star for a long time. Danny embodies a critical journalism practice reporting on race and reproductive health. She's a contributing writer at The Nation, a fellow with Type Media Center, and author of We Live for the We, The Political Power of Black Motherhood. We're also excited to be joined by longtime Black Star fam, Loida Limbal, AKA DJ Lalo, who is an Afro-Dominican filmmaker interested in the creation of art that is nuanced and revelatory for communities of color. Loida is the Senior Vice President of Programs at Firelight Media and the director of mm -hmm. Through the Night, a feature documentary about a 24-hour daycare center, which I'm sure many of us had the mm -hmm. pleasure of tuning into during last night's screening. Come on, mama, time to get up. Morning, baby. All right. Noah. Time to get up, Noah. I've been doing this for 22 years. I have all different types of families in my daycare. I have some that comes in at 6 o'clock in the morning that works at 8.30 at night. I have some that comes from 3.30 to 12.30 at night. I have some that comes in overnight. I see a lot of parents come in and break down. They don't want to do this, but they need to go out and work and pay their bills and take care of their family. All right, I'll see you later. All right, baby, have a good day. Be careful. This is the way the world is set up at this point. I work on the night shift in a pediatric emergency room from 7 p.m. to 7.30 a.m. I never really thought of overnight childcare until I had to use it. What? I've been working seven days for like almost two months. If I'm not working one job, I'm working in another job. So I'm always working and working. Hi, Hi everyone. Nuno is like my other mom. She helped me a lot. I can't believe you still have kids. You know I have a house full of kids. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Love you guys very much. Bye -bye. I see you Monday. I have a Diana, but I don't think you're her bus. Chase, my grandson, yes. Your grandson? My grandson. I didn't know he was going to be on the bus today. Yes. Yes, that's mine. <laughs> it's not just a job. This is really our life. My whole family has to be involved. My children, ever since they was the age of two years old, they had to share me with other children. I remember my children saying, Mommy, why do they have to come first? Mommy! As parents, you make sacrifices. It's not their fault that I work the way that I work, so I just do what I can. It's not easy, but, you know, eventually I'll sleep. Do we love each other? Yeah. I didn't hear you. Yeah. Do we love each other? Yeah. daycare provider, so I'm constantly picking up babies and... Then you have to be careful. If you continue to have numbness, you need a surgery. Uh-oh. 
This work is hard. I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing because I feel like if I lay down, I'm so tired I might not get back up. Thank you so much for making and sharing that beautiful work with us, Loida. We're thrilled to also have Natasha K. Engaiza, a filmmaker and professor who explores themes of migration, identity, diaspora, matrilineality, and intimacy in her work. Her short film, A Mother, will be screened on Tuesday, August 25th at 7.30 p.m. during the Nimbus Shorts program. So be sure to mark your calendars for that. We welcome Alan Holt to the festival again. Alan is the director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford University. There she trains the, su the student community in areas of diversity and culture, arts leadership, and social justice. She is a mother and practicing artist whose work includes theater, poetry, and film. Finally, we welcome Roni Nicole Henderson Day another longtime Black Star participant and artist whose spirited experiments in film, installation, photography, and performance reveals the ancestral and interpersonal nature of memories, intimacy, and human emotion. This is a still from Ronnie's work, The Dance. Wonderful. Well, I'm so excited to um, have the opportunity to moderate this conversation. Thank you, Farah, for the, those introductions the opportunity to um, get a taste of the work that some of the work that we'll be discussing today. Um, I just want to get right into this conversation. We have so much to talk about. So I would like to start with you, Natasha. Um, I'm curious, what if any narratives around motherhood and family, um, black family life, are you disrupting or correcting in your work? Um, and it's a bit of a two-parter because while well, I'm curious what you're, you know, disrupting or correcting, I'm also curious if there are new narratives around motherhood that you're hoping to amplify or create. Right, right. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I want to say um, first that I'm so inspired to be on this panel with such um, amazing women who are so mothers creating like such inspirational work. So this is like really exciting for me. I just want to say that. Um, first, and so to answer your question, I think that, you know, when I start writing for a film, I'm always starting from my own experiences um, uh, with my own identity as a Tanzanian American woman. 
So my family is is from Tanzania. I was born in England. Um, I lived there for six years, and then I came here. I uh, lived in New York, and but I always had this like you know being East African, um, kind of coming into my black identity from my lived experiences in the United States, not necessarily from the experiences of my parents, um, if that makes sense. So I think that in that sense, I'm always looking at telling stories of of the kinds of women that I grew up around, the the identity that I have personally, which is a kind of first and a half generation immigrant Black woman, which are stories that we don't typically see, I would say, um, in film um, when it comes to especially black, black motherhood. I don't see a lot of those stories represented. So I am interested in, in, in looking at that. Um, and in terms of maybe disrupting the narrative, I mean, with my film, A Mother, um, it's a film about a, abortion, but it's also a film about it's a film about Black Lives Matter. It's a film about about a really good mother, also, and so exploring those kind the, the kinds of challenges that come with motherhood. The kind of um, I want to say a flawed motherhood, right? That it's not that we're neither martyrs who are you know queens that are saving the day, nor are we just you know abusive and neglectful. Uh, women either you know there's a whole range in between there's so many nuances there's so there's so many kind of big and small challenges that i'd like to see um represented that i'd like to to share you know from of my own experiences too um and and a lot of those can sometimes seem to be incompatible at least in the ways that we're that motherhood is talked about maybe in 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 sort of uh public conversation, right? Um, so yeah, those those are the kinds of things that I'm, you know, personally interested in exploring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, watching a creation story, I was just struck by um, just the intimacy of the relationship between the mother and the daughter. And, you know, we get to see this intimate moment, you know, a little girl getting her hair done, her scalp oiled, her, um, and then the kind of sing song lilting voice in which her mother is telling her this beautiful story about why we take care of our hair. And I just felt like it was such a, um, a uh, it's not a piece of the relationship that I see that often. And I was really thankful for, for you putting that on the screen. I'm curious if that question resonates with others of you, this, this idea of like, are there new narratives that you're trying to create or are you speaking back to or clapping back at existing narratives that don't fit? Yeah, I, that definitely resonates for me. Um, and a lot of what Natasha said, um, particularly around like the piece of nuance resonates. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm really interested in creating work um, you know, so to, to situate where I'm coming from is, you know, I was raised by a single working immigrant, uh, poor working class mother, right? And in New York, in the Bronx, uh, and my community is a community that's uh, Black and Latinx, poor and working class folks. Um, and so I think I'm really interested in bringing nuance to the representation of that world and those worlds um, because there's so much sort of stigma uh, and you know poverty one is just stigmatized and criminalized in this country um, but then certainly as a person of color you know there's this way in which our lives are um, really reduced um, so the representations that we see of ourselves are super productive and I'm interested in creating work that makes visible um, both like the poetry and the genius of our everyday. Um, so I'm interested in kind of like creating cinematic work that can help feed our imaginations and reframe these things that we sort of take for granted um, that is the, the labor and the domain of black and brown women and femmes. Um, there are all these sort of 
you know, small to large, everyday, constant gestures, right, that are part of a mothering experience that are um, uh, dismissed, invisibilized, disrespected, and um, uh, undervalued. And so I'm, I'm trying to sort of make that legible first to ourselves in the experience, but to each other. Um, mm. And so I'm really interested in the creation of that kind of work, um, visually and, and, and cinematic work. Um, I would also say that I'm countering uh, notions of, you know, this idea of like mother as martyr, uh, which Natasha mentioned, um, but also just what I feel like is this very sanitized mm -hmm. version of what motherhood is um, yes. that sort of reduces it to this kind of like very safe thing. You know, it's like supposedly you become a mom and you're supposed to be, you're like, you become more conservative because you care most about, you know, the safety of your children, um, you know, or on the other end of the spectrum, it's like you're supposed to be automatically become like a great baker or something when you become a mother. Like these, there's these really like sanitized, you know, and safe ideas, right? Like in terms of how we think of mothers. And I, I'm, I want to trouble that. I'm countering that in my, in my work um, because I actually think that, you know, to mother when you're black or you're brown, you're poor, indigenous, undocumented, immigrant, all these things, queer, trans, um, I, I see mothering uh, in that context as deeply radical, um, visionary, subversive work. Um, and I want to recast it in that light and again, help our imaginations be freed up around it. Um, so that's, I think another piece is just trying to really center mothering as a site of liberation and possibility um, as opposed to this sanitized and safe thing that is completely uninteresting to me. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then I would say um, I'm also, you know, interested in the context of this conversation. I'm also equally excited and honored to be on this panel with you all because the the possibility of centering our motherhood in the midst of all these things that we do, um, at least for me, is not an opportunity that I get often. Um, and part of it, that the reason I'm making the film, that I made the film and I'm doing this work is because I'm trying to center motherhood um, in everything at all times. Um, but just that, that there's this common notion that um, once you, that motherhood or mothering is a death sentence, uh, for artists, you know, women uh, and mothers as artists, that there's this sort of, once you have kids, that's it. You're not gonna be able to create anymore. Um, and I, I wanna counter that, and so I'm also really interested in hearing um, everyone's experiences and stories, because I think that this is how we, we begin to do that work. That's a great transition, Loida, into something I know we all wanna get into, which is the how. Like how do how do you make films while also parenting? And as we when the conversation that we had to prepare for this panel, um, many of you spoke about mothering young children and what it was like to have them with you on set or otherwise with you while you were working. And Alan, you said something that really stuck with me um, along the lines of parenting forces you to reestablish every place that you are. Um, and Ronnie's talked about being in film school while parenting a kindergarten age child. And as someone with a preschooler, I know that anything that you do <laughs> while also trying to care for a four or five year old is like just a bumps up the, the level of challenge. So um, how have you met the demands of filmmaking while mothering? Even just, it's very, you know, it's like a very phys physically demanding on both fronts. Ronnie, I'm so curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, it's interesting because for me, it kind of is my mother, right? Um, passing and then developing this whole language, visual language with me in my dreams. So I had a child and I was at a vulnerable enough place to hear her. You know, because for a certain number of the, the years after her death, um, it was just still walled in. And I, you know, so divorce and needing to like flee a home I bought and, you know, all those things created the ripe environment for my mother to say, 
okay, you're a woman, let's talk. You and and even that statement, you know, this even this that it's a rite of passage to suffer mm. as women. That's a whole nother. So anyway, film school was uh I had to get it out. So it was like this kind of blessed a uh, series of women. My grandmother gave the blessing that I needed to follow the calling. And then I got to Savannah and um, a young lady I had mentored when she was a teenager in YEA, shout out, Youth Ensemble of Atlanta. Um, but anyway, she was at SCAD as well and she became our community. And I grew a community. I remember um, this very powerful I think she might be called a prophetess uh, at a, at one of the churches where you know you wash feet. She, she gave me a job, like, and had me teaching um, her students because it was an independent school, um, dance, theater. You know what I mean? Like, you find your current film school as a single mom was about community. Just that's really my whole life. So the grace of community. And that's how we did it, you know. But also I had a really gracious child. Um, Ariel is my oldest and she loved to read and anything, because I was an English major when I had her at Clark Atlanta, I also did undergrad with a child. Um, and so she read because I read, you know? So I, you know, I'm taking pictures, she's taking pictures, you know? So she was sitting in the lab and it's funny because today her job is like design, you know, and she's like working for artists, you know? Um, so it's this full circle. So it was hard and women took care of my baby. They took her to dance class. They fed her sometimes, you know, they bought her things. Um, they made her Miss Black Star one year. Anyway, sorry, come on back, come on back. Y'all not gonna, I'm not gonna be first. Um, Bring it. But I say, so shout out all the aunties. Forget that. I'm sorry. I'm doing it. The auntie gang that my daughters have, you know, Maori is one of them. Um, Aisha, this is her shirt. I don't know if you can see it. It says family reunion. It's her mom and her pops. It's a tribe that allows you to make art and be a mom, period. So that's all. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, Ronnie. I'm just like, mm -hmm. I just resonate with so much of what you just said. And, um, you know, thinking about motherhood for me, it, it never, it never made things feel less possible, but it definitely clarified the vision for me and also just grew my discernment in ways I'm so thankful for. So what you said about Danny, what you said about the comment I made, um, you know, if, if a space I entered into couldn't, also occupy my daughter indigo who's now seven but you know over the years then maybe it also couldn't occupy me and i felt like it, it really rerouted my whole life my understanding of who was around me my understanding of having better boundaries um and all of that stuff are, are things that i'm so thankful to be able to take into my filmmaking practice so it's like how do we create very safe sets how do we create sets that are integrative and not a capitalist, which means your kids go over there and you're separated and you work for 14, 18, however many hours. <laughs> but how do we create um, you know, opportunities for work that integrate us all and that are safe for us all, um, which I feel like literally is a disruption to the mainstream Hollywood kind of paradigm of the way that filmmaking works. Um, and as an independent filmmaker, why not? I feel like this is the, the mirroring and the modeling of what we want all of our sets to be. Um, and then also to a space that allows you to rest, you know, that doesn't force you to work to the bone, but really can create more of a nourishing experience. Like, of course, we're all going hard in those, like, however many days you have to get the work um, captured on film, but also like it can be, it can be a community, you know, that, that even Ronnie mentioned. And also too, I love how it folds into the ethos of like the film festivals. Like for me, Black Star was the first festival I showed my film in. Um, a handful of years ago. And um, just the fact that they offered childcare for filmmakers, I was just like, remember just crying when I got that notice. 
<laughs> because like so much of motherhood, you, you know, it, it gets isolating because the world is not built for mothers and children. The world is built for like single men, you know, um, and that can feel very isolating. But when you can be able to identify the spaces that actually show up for you, um, and show up not just for you, but for your children and your family. Like those are the kind of spaces I want to always uplift and like cherish. And, you know, those are the spaces that are mine and for me. So those are some thoughts around that. Yeah. I I would love to, um, you know, as you're talking about making that's um, kind of accessible to mothers and motherhood and, and parenting um, and children, right? I That was something that that was really important to me when um, in pre-production for a mother. It was like, I have now three kids and uh, I have a two-year-old, a six-year-old and old. And I was breastfeeding at the time um, during, during the set of a mother. And so it was like, I'm like, we have to build that in, right? Um, it, it has to be a part of, of the set. Uh, I'm not gonna go um, 12 hours without breastfeeding or at least pumping right so and i remember even in when i ma made my film blackout i was actually breastfeeding at the time i was a um, breastfeeding she was 10 months old and i i made a point <laughs> to say on set like i would publicly say okay i am going to breastfeed now i am breastfeeding my daughter because it is time and i felt like this was something that i had to kind of claim to sort of like make it known or to sort of make it fill up the space in, in a kind of way um, that was, it felt really important to me at the time. I mean, now this, this time around, I didn't feel the need to say it out loud, but, but still it was important that we kind of integrated that into how we, we made the set. I mean, of course, then it becomes really complicated. We realize that then, it, then there's more money involved, right? Because the more time that you spend if you're not working 14 hour days or 12 hour days, that means maybe the shoot extends a little longer. And that means that there's, it's actually more money. Anyway, there are logistical issues that then we had to work out, but that was still very important um, for, for me and for my producer as well. And I, I also want to say, I, I really love, I love this question because for me, becoming a mother, I always wanted to make films, right? For a long time. I was like, I, I want to make films. But then becoming a mother, it felt like a need now. It's like, I need, I need to do this. I need to do this. And I don't know why exactly. I don't know if I can maybe articulate what the need is, but there's something about maybe having my daughter see me or, or um, th there's something that feels like, nope, I've got to get this done. It's absolutely, I'm here and I need to do it. And that's it. And nobody's kind of standing in my way. Um, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can I jump in on that too? Or you're going to say something, Alan? Mm -mm. Um, I actually want to add like a, a different piece of it um, because one of the big things for me when I was working on Through the Night was I kept holding on to the idea of like idyllic time away at a residency, you know, in a cabin near a babbling brook where I could have my creative process and have so much inspiration and, you know, and that never came <laughs> in the four years because I couldn't be away from home long enough to have, you know, any of those kind of artistic or filmmaking residency experiences. Um, and I remember, Kind of using that as an excuse um, when I was scared of the creative work that was required, the next step, I would use the fact that I didn't have the ideal, in air quotes, right, ideal conditions to, to for the artistic process. I would use that as, as an excuse to like let myself off the hook and oh, that's why I'm not getting that done. You know, when in reality, it was, you know, I, there was a fear or an insecurity about the next step and messing up the next step or failing. And it wasn't until I let go of that notion that in order to create, I needed, you know, some kind of consistent block of time or some beautiful, you know, physical space or just time away. Um, 
I, I made the film, you know, the, the company I incorporated to make it is called Third Shift Media. It was my third shift. I was working my full-time job. I was raising my two kids by myself. And then around that, I made the film. And, you know, and so that, that just was like, all right, this is what it is. Um, but I need to do this. I need to finish this um, for myself, for the, for, for the protagonist in the film. Um, and so it, when I let go of that kind of expectation, I also lost the resentment that was weighing me down around not being able to have that experience. And then I was able to do the work, you know? So what it became for me was like, I realized that while I'm driving is a really generative time for me. So I would watch, you know, my rushes really early in the morning, feed my kids, get everybody ready for school. And on the drive to school, like, you know, I would kind of zone out, even if my kids were talking to me and think about, you know, the footage that I had just watched. And, you know, that's just real talk. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, when you have lots of creative things going on in your mind, you're not as present, you know, sort of mentally for everything else. Um, and that's just the reality, right? Because all these things require more than 100% of you, but you're one person, you know? And so also just like kind of being okay with that being like an ebb and flow and a give and take. And that, you know, sometimes this is going to get a little more of me than that. And that's going to get a little bit, you know, but just kind of being honest with myself about it, you know, and kind of being able to uh, confront my own ish around it all, you know, and just being, yeah, just being honest of, about the, the messiness of, of it all, you know, um, mm -hmm. there's something I wanted to add to the, the conversation. Mm -hmm. I so appreciate listening to y'all talk about this. Um, Natasha, what you said about like you always wanted to make films, but once you had once you became a mother, it was like you needed to. And that I just um, I feel that so much. You know, I always wanted to write a book, but then it within my daughter's first two years of being alive, that's when I actually wrote a book. And it's because I think it just clarified what was important to me. I didn't have time to waste anymore. You know, I think I had almost like too much time to think that like it'll happen or or again, I don't have those ideal circumstances like Lloyda was talking about. And I think in some ways having a child has been the best thing for my professional life because it's just lit a fire under me in a way that I never would have expected or anticipated. Um, I'm curious, um, actually Lloyda, let's just, cause this is something that came up when we, when we um, have talked in the past. Um, I'm curious about this question of whether filmmaking supports your parenting and vice versa if parenting supports or strengthens your filmmaking. Lloyda, you made this point. Um, you said the muscles that I use in mothering have been really helpful in my creative work and that you found that some of the skills have been transfer transferable. Um, could you speak to that a bit? Um, I think often, as we've said, motherhood is seen as an obstacle to creative work, but it sounds like many of you have found it to be just the, just the opposite. Did we, we may have lost Lloyd's audio. Okay, so. Let's try, let's try this. We're waiting for Loida's um, audio to come back in. And what we'll do in the meantime is I have this um, other direction that I'd like for us to go. Uh, I really enjoyed watching Alan's film in Emirata. Um, and it made me think about, I mean, all of you, um, most, many of your films are quite personal and in some cases explicitly autobiographical. And I'm wondering how do you, or how will you talk to your children about um, why you've decided to share certain explorations of family and intimacy with the, with the wider world? Is it, do you, do you grapple with questions around privacy and boundaries as you make your work? And how do you decide what to share and what to, what to keep close? Yeah. Alan, I'd love to, 
to start with you. Absolutely. Yeah. So my um, my first film, in Amarada, was um, an exploration of me entangling with another being, becoming a mother, and then ultimately that relationship kind of imploding on itself and me trying to figure out what to do with all of those pieces left behind and how to create something new from them. Um, deeply autobiographical. Um, but you know, like before, and I used to talk about my work as being very much around intimacy. And, and it's not until these last couple of years that I have been reminded that intimacy is literally into me see. So I have to bring literally that, which is my personal experience, my real experience, and not be afraid of that, the messiness of those experiences. And through sharing that, um, the ability for not only me to see myself better, but my daughter to see me better, to see herself better. And then hopefully the audience to be able to do that same kind of introspective work. Um, in particular with this film, it was, you know, my dis my decision, our decision to decouple me and, and my um, the father of my child's decision to decouple, you know, obviously has deep effects on my child's life for the rest of her life. And so for me, it was important to document this moment. It is a, a narrative. It is, you know, it's not a documentary. It is um, fiction. But to use the quality of fiction to tell this truth about what happened, you know, and to tell it in a real time moment. Um, and to tell it in the most unbiased way that I could, which required me to kind of document it in real time. And so for me, uh, now that she's seven years old, eight years old, and she was deeply a part of the process the whole way through, um, not on set, but definitely, you know, in the editing room and in post-production. Um, but to be able to like share that with her as this relic now that she's a lot older, it, it is this conversation starter that, and really this like full conversation piece <laughs> that allows us just to connect and, and also has allowed me to connect with her father in ways that are healthy and have good boundaries. And also to connect with the other women that were a part of that story in ways that have been like nothing but healing. Um, and so for me, I think what was important for me to share in this conversation was the way that filmmaking can mother us. Um, and the way that we can be carried through um, to a new moment through our work and through the process of creating work. Um, and, and yeah, and so for that film, it allowed me to fall back in love with him, not literally in this real time moment, but to just document and remember the journey that got us here. And, um, and also now, like a handful of um, moments later, like I'll just be like so transparent. <laughs> vulnerable and so transparent to say like at this current moment I am um you know not moving forward with the child like in this and so I'm like bedridden right now moving through that process um and just to be able to reflect on that first opportunity of of becoming a and taking a child to term and and all that I learned in that process and to be able to see the ways that I'm continuing to learn through this process it's um the work just mothers you you know and so i it, it is like always like ronnie said this full circle opportunity but it gives you that up, a place to work outside of your body so you're not just figuring all this stuff out within your like literal self you're able to have this vessel that can do some of that holding for you and so that's what i love about filmmaking i i also work in plays and work in theater and you know, if you're not there for that show, you missed it. <laughs> or you see the pictures of it. But for film, it's like, this is the work. And, and, it, and it travels and it holds time in ways that I appreciate so much across, you know, the mediums that I do work in. So for me, intimacy is into me see. Um, so that is the practice. That is the creative practice of all of this. So you have to quickly learn to be unafraid of being that, mm. of being that vulnerable. And I think it works and is rewarding. Thank you for your vulnerability and for sharing this current moment in your journey with us. Thank you. Um, exactly, right? I'm, uh, you know, in the moment, I'm sure, Elon, how you might have felt was that it just had to get out, right? And now, you know, um, for me, thinking about um, making a film about that heartbreak process and really 
I made the film because I needed a pep talk, right? To get to the next stage. Because for my second child, she snuck in, you know? Right in that moment where you think, wow, my daughter's in high school, you know? That like, I'm almost done, that's right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so that second child coming in um, and then kind of like all the things that I thought I had learned um and knew as a woman you know it's like that i'm wise i'm wiser than that or something um i had to get, i had to really go through that with myself you know what i mean like you're a human being um you're not an archetype as we've been talking about motherhood period you're not an archetype um there are times when your intuition will turn itself down so mm -hmm. that life can happen. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Life has to happen. You know? So um, I would say now I'm thinking about it because when Aziri was uh, born, um, well, when I was pregnant with her, I made the film The Dance Begets the Dance. And in the first section, I deal with the heartbreak um, of making a child, which is this intimate act, and then kind of like the, the you know, you turn your back to one another. Um, and I had mm -hmm. never dreamed of being pregnant and not being nurtured like as a you know as a 35 year old woman that was like what does that even mean you know like i know too much now i, I know better i know how to pick you know so it's like this moment and so i had a great deal of heartbreak and i needed to reckon with that and the child wanted me to connect myself back to my power my thread back to the women that have all got us here you know what i mean like we are we are in a line. We're not an island. We're we're in a line. And even if we are an island, there's a bit a base deep under, you know, like there is a connection that will allow you to go through this process, the sacred process. And it's painful, you know, but you have to, you like have to shed it. And um so you know, I would say Aziri had an energy even in my belly where I found myself taking photographs of myself. Um getting dressed you know she's got leo moon it's like she was already ready you know and so she came to black star as a little baby and someone actually said oh it's the moon baby and i was like whoa wait that was that moment where i was like wait have i revealed too much people think they know my child that's not safe you know but then i was like you're a black star though they will know your yeah. child they, it's a family reunion you know what i mean like but she's protected from so many other spaces, but I, I do have to reckon with that, you know? I don't know how she'll feel as an adult. Um, my other daughter has been in my films um, for a very long time. So um, we'll see, you know, you never know. Kids, kids might be like, you know, every child is different in terms of how they internalize their experience, you know? So um, I pray that, that I'm the good guy in their story, at least most of the time, so. <laughs> this Absolutely. is such a this is such an eye-opening conversation for me because these are the questions that I'm currently grappling with that I'm that I'm struggling through. I mean, with a mother, I what was I was writing it for a while, right? Or I was writing a version of it for a while. And I was also going through therapy and teaching. Um, screenwriting and filmmaking and I and I was telling my students like you need to be willing to go into your own experiences right everybody has a story to tell but then when I was writing my own film I was telling other people's stories and it wasn't working right it wasn't and I was like what is going on why can't I why can't I break through and then I was like oh right I need to I need to practice what I'm what I'm preaching to my students and so that's when the breakthrough came and I was able to write mother um, but tapping into those kinds of anxieties and, and, and experiences, it was, I love this. I love that, Alan, you say that, you know, the work mothers you. I love that. that that's exactly how I, how I feel about all of the, the films that I've done so far. But then there, so once I, I, I wrote it, I was like, great, this is great. Then you make it and it's great. And then it's like, oh no, but now it's out in the world. <laughs> 
And now other people have it and they can do whatever they want with it. And, and I don't, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what that means still, right? I mean, my daughter is in a mother and that was a process that um, she, she plays them. There's a missing girl who's kidnapped and there's all the, and that's my daughter. And I, it took me the longest time to put her in the film. And I kept telling her, no, she wanted to be in it. And I was like, no, I can't, I can't put you, I can't cast you as a missing girl, my own daughter. There's something about that that seems energetically wrong, right? <laughs> a person's child, okay, but not my own child. I mean, there was something that's like, it's too close, right? It's too close, it doesn't make sense. But then it worked and it was great and she was wonderful and she enjoyed it and she wants to be in more stuff, but I'm still, ch it's still a challenge to figure out like, well, where's the line um, with vulnerability? How, how vulnerable does one get? How much do you reveal? You know, when people ask me about a mother and like, well, is it, you know, I say it's from, there's a lot of it that's my own experience. It's fiction, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to reveal everything about me to the world. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's an ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing, it's an, it's an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing challenge for me as a filmmaker to be like, okay, well, where, yeah, where do I draw the line between me and the, and the work? Um, but this is really eye opening for me and I'm really encouraged by, by you all's, your, your bravery, <laughs> your courage, um, to move forward. I, I love that. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. Thank you. So we touched on this a bit, but I want to drill down um, to get into some specifics about whether there are skills that you build in filmmaking that support your mothering, whether there are skills that you've built through parenting and mothering that support your filmmaking. Um, and as I said before, you know, this has come up, like, I think I personally held this idea that I'd have to figure out how to work in spite of being a mother, but um, there's a way that in fact, I think it can boost our creative powers. Um, we've touched on it a bit, but it, would anybody else like to, to talk, speak to that more? Do we have Loida back? Loida, is your audio back with us? It's like not quite yet. We can't. She can hear us, but we can't hear her. So hopefully we'll figure that out. Yeah, I'll speak to it. Wait. Should we wait? Okay. I mean, one of the biggest things is on the, on the filmmaking to mothering side is that you just can't do it alone, you know? The filmmaking, I think, has really taught me that, that it really is about collaboration and that we need, we all have our roles and we need to fill our roles, but we also need to be dynamic enough to shift roles, you know? Um, and all of that process is like something that you can't do alone. And it's like, would be silly to think you could do it alone. And I think, um, you know, with the kind of uh, feelings of abandonment that came from having my first child, it was really healing to be able to be working within a medium that is just inherently collaborative and that family can be formed in like a handful of weeks and that can like last for lifetimes, you know, that kind of knowledge. And then on the film, on the parenting to the filmmaking side, um, just like you said, trusting your instincts, trusting that you're the boss, like making those decisions and making decisions for the betterment of not only the work, but of the vision. Um, being able to be strong in that, um, but also to be able to be tender and to like get really, you know, intimate and experiential with your actors and to like be able to cultivate a sense of caring someone through a series of emotions, which is, if that's not raising young people, I don't know what, <laughs> what is like careful holding of so many emotions that come. <laughs> You know, from one time to another, I, I feel like it's all been so complimentary. And, you know, the best feeling I think has been when um, 
you have that moment where someone is just really meets you, you know, I want to definitely make sure that even as we're talking about mother, mothering and motherhood, that we still recognize that we do need each other. We need our fathers. We need uh, the masculine presence in our lives as well. No matter how complicated those relationships can be. Like, I think the biggest joy and sense of accomplishment is when like you can reach out your hand and be met with a similar hand and then can like move forward in that but also to know that like you can just do it as well <laughs> you know so i think it just holds all those complexities that that you know completely speak to one another and so yeah it's, for me it's all the same it's all the same thing yeah mm -hmm. i agree, I agree. Can y'all hear me now? Yes, yes. welcome right back. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I could hear everything, so I've been soaking it all, soaking it all in. Thankfully, um, I'm feeling really called right now to take a step back from the sort of individual, personal, and and say like this idea that we have to create in spite of or. Even Ronnie, like when you talked at the top, this notion of like suffering as a right to passage, like I want to name the systemic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these are things that come, that we internalize on purpose, right? It, this is by design. Um, and, you know, th this notion that we're supposed to like mother as if we don't do anything else. You know, it's like you're supposed to mother as if you don't work, you're supposed to work as if you don't mother you know, to keep us in this constant loop of like shame and guilt and all these things, right? Um, that, that is systemic, you know? Um, and I, I wanna actually share um, a quote from an essay uh, in Revolutionary Mothering uh, that Alexis Pauline Gums wrote, um, because I think that ultimately like what I'm after is making legible how the, the the muscles that you develop in this journey of mothering are actually really good for a whole host of things, um, as opposed to being this kind of obstacle or this in spite of, or this thing that, you know, automatically casts you aside and puts you on the bench. Um, and that even more so that like our collective survival and our ability to thrive depends on us collectively reimagining um, and changing the way that we view mothers and treat people who mother, um, that that is not something that we have the luxury to not do. Um, you know, there's this, in, in this essay, she, she writes about um, uh, a book uh, that Hortense Spillers wrote in, in 87, um, and she talks about motherhood as a status that is granted by patriarchy to white middle-class women, those women whose legal rights to their children are never questioned, regardless of who does the labor of keeping them alive. And then she says, mothering is another matter, a possible action, the name for that nurturing work, that survival dance, worked by enslaved women who were forced to breastfeed the children of the status mothers while having no control over whether their birth or chosen children were sold away. Mothering is a form of labor worked by immigrant nannies like my grandmother. Uh, mothering is worked, is worked by chosen and accidental mentors who agree to support some, ungrown, some growing unpredictable thing called the future. Mothering is worked by house mothers in ball culture who provide spaces of self-love and expression for queer and trans youth of color in the street. And what would it mean if we take the word mother less as a gendered identity and more as a possible action, a technology of transformation that those people who do the most mothering labor are teaching us right now? Um, and so I'm thinking about like this moment too, right? Like bringing all of this into like, we're living in COVID and, and the multiple pandemics and everything falling apart, it's like, you know, how, how can we um, shift our lens around mothering collectively um, and value, you know, the people that do the work of caregiving um, and in, irrespective of what bodies they're in, right? Because I also feel like I want to detach a little bit from mothering as something that only like cisgendered 
biological mm-hmm. mothers can do, you know? Um, and and that, that's like the question. I think like that's what like COVID is making us think about right now, right? Like there's not going to be any recovery, any economic recovery if we don't figure out this childcare piece. Like it's all mm-hmm. gone to, to hell. And now everybody knows, you know, what it is. And what, what women and femmes have been doing individually in their private spheres, in their private lives, the tightrope, the tightrope, you know, that we've been walking, it's now visible. And so for me, it's like, let's make that collective and it's a collective responsibility to figure this out. It's not just, you know, on me, Loida, because I have my specific dreams and desires and needs, you know? Mm-hmm. It's a technology, yo. It's like, we got muscles, we got wisdom, you know, that our people need, you know? And so like, it just is a matter of like, let's value that, you know? 100%. Oh, sorry. I just, I, I, I wanted to, I just wanted to, this reminded me of something that, that Ronnie was mentioning before. And I think Alan, you mentioned this, the extended, the extended network, right, of people in our lives that, that also make mothering possible and, um, you know, how important it is. I mean, I know my mother-in-law came for instance, she's come multiple times, many times to help um, with, uh, you know, with our kids and, and my husband also, who's a phenomenal partner and also a filmmaker. And so understands what it, it takes and all of those things, um, you sort of make me who, who I am and make the, the journey possible. But I'm so glad that you, Loira, that you also point out, you know, what's happening with the pandemic and, um, and I'm just re- kind of reflecting on what we've decided to do in the fall. And we've created like our own sort of pods. We have the ability, luckily the privilege to be able to do this with a group of friends to, to kind of isolate our kids and have a pod going on. But what does that mean for everybody else? Yeah, there's so many questions here about the, the systemic kind of um, issues that affect motherhood right and the the extended and everybody else that also affects how we mother our children um that i think is so important to to reflect on Mm -hmm. absolutely broadening the lens right and like just acknowledging that we're in this um moment of upheaval and and potential transformation um, does anybody else want to speak to, and also thank you for bringing in Alexis Pauline Gums, particularly that essay in, in Revolutionary Mothering, um, and the distinction between motherhood as an institution and mothering as a verb and a technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have I, just a few minutes, so please go ahead. I was going to say it's, it, it is a technology, um, because you know, because it's not, it doesn't stop at one person, you know, it's a network of things that, that kind of conspire, you know, to help you out, to get you there. Um, I like to think that of that as like a spirit, right? People don't even know why they're helping you sometimes, you know what I mean? They just know they have to, and it may become clear later, you know? Um, but there's, there's an energy at work there and we would be remiss when talking about mothers to not talk about ancestors because in truth, <laughs> you know, it's like, I think everybody's trying to get that, get that DNA to, to, you know, to ring up in us um, and restore our knowledge, you know what I mean? Beyond knowledge, you know? Um, there is something to kind of inform and mother us to a new place and, you know, The pandemic, um, this pandemic has allowed me to spend time with my children um, in a way that I had not been able to. And I'm thankful. Mm -hmm. It's like life is that sticky thing, you know, in the midst of um, you often find you remember what's important, you know, and so Mm -hmm. um, I would even link that back to maybe why I make films about those personal memories because it's a moment of breakthrough that I like to examine and even reimagine because um, 
if you reckon with it and reckon with what that spirit technology is trying to tell you, give you um, the ways in which it's trying to gird you um, and allow that to come out in the work, then people can connect with that and it becomes its own act of healing to the world. And, you know, I like film in that way because you can, like you said, with theater, it's gone, you know, and I love theater, but it's, it's this need to allow something to keep working in ripples as opposed to like requiring your, you know, making films is hard. And even down to, I'm even lazy about applying to festivals. Like it's work. It's continues to be work, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been appreciating my hiatus actually. <laughs> Breaks are good, you no? Know? Breaks are necessary. So. Um, on that note, we're gonna have to close up. I feel like we could talk forever, but um, I wanna thank each of you for being a part of this conversation, for bringing your wisdom and your experiences um, to share uh, with, with um, all of us and with the audience. Thank you to those of us, sorry, thank you to those of you who tuned in and joined us. Uh, please make a point of finding each of these filmmakers online where you can follow uh, their work and keep up with what they're doing. Thank you to Black Star um, for hosting this panel and bringing all of us together. We so appreciate you and I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival.